Well, welcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fueling Collaboration. My name is Andrea Brandon. I'm the Science Delivery Specialist with the Northern Research Station, and it is my absolute privilege to be uh, introducing Fueling Collaboration to you all today. So Fueling Collaboration is a panel discussion series presented by the Forest Service Northern Research Station and Southern Research Station as well as the joint fire science programs, um, a fire science exchange networks in the East. So these are the Consortium of Appalachian Fire Managers and Scientists, the Lake States Fire Science Consortium, North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange, the Oak Woodlands and Forest Fire Consortium, Southern Fire Exchange, and the Tall Grass Prairie and Oak Savannah Fire Science Consortium. Uh, amazing group of, of folks here. So our goal is to bring together researchers and managers to learn about and discuss the latest in fire science and fire management, as well as to build collaborative opportunities across the region. Today is the first of a five part series um, where we are um, uh, uh, presenting this panel discussion series. Um, and if this is your first time uh, learning about fueling collaboration, we're so glad you're here. If you were able to participate in last year's series, welcome back. So before we uh, launch in to today's, today's discussion, I just wanna acknowledge all of the organizers from those different fire science exchange networks that have participated in making this series happen. So those names and, and individuals that are on the screen, every single one of these folks have put a lot of time, energy, and effort into making Fueling Collaboration a fun and exciting and informative experience. So thank you uh, all to our organizers. I think that's a, about it as far as the introductions. And I know you all did not log on to hear me talk, so I'm gonna stop. And at this point, I will pass it over to you, Nick. And I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. All right, thank you, Andrea. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nick Skaronsky. I'm a research forester for the US Forest Service Northern Research Station. Um, I started early in my career uh, after my undergraduate work as an environmental specialist at Fort Dix in New Jersey, uh, doing a lot of different things, uh, but really became interested in fire at that time. And I was actually just preparing another presentation uh, yesterday, and I found a photo that I took from, I think, one of my first prescribed burns, and it was just 19 years and eight months ago that I took that picture. So uh, it was kind of an interesting thing to see how long I've been around already. Um, so I eventually became the prescribed burn coordinator at Fort Dix and then moved just down the road to a technical job at the Silas Little Experimental Forest uh, with the Northern Research Station and finished up my PhD eventually uh, from Rutgers uh, and then up my current position. So during that time sort of in academia and as a researcher, I've, I've really tried to keep one foot firmly in the black. Uh, and I've, I've spent time working in prescribed fire with the New Jersey Forest Fire Service and also gone on a variety of Western assignments over that, that time period. So today I'm gonna kind of lean on my planning and operational experience a little bit more than my research experience. And I've, I've knocked the dust off my fire manager hat, which I'm, I'm probably gonna end up with all, having on at some point. So uh, I'm also the principal of the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange and uh, so I've spent a, a, a bit of time thinking about how we communicate science and more recently how we do it in a uh, virtual environment. But my favorite time and place uh, to have interactions between fire managers, fire practitioners, scientists, graduate students has always been at the Tall Timbers Research Station in Tallahassee, Florida. There's a uh, huge live oak uh, that's just covered in Spanish moss right next to the dorm facility there. And I've thought many times over the past two years about the barbecue that we cooked there, the refreshments that we had, and the fire that we used to sit around uh, in, 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 in our, our dirty Nomex and, and talk about uh, fire science, fire management, fire operations all together sort of as a, as a group with everybody bringing different things to the table and discussing freely. And so we, we can't really replicate that atmosphere today uh, but the Fueling Collaboration team has done a great job in designing these sessions to continue in the spirit of that type of conversation. 
And so unfortunately we can't interact with all of you, but we're really trying to get our scientist panel today to interact almost as if they're sitting around a campfire uh, after a long day, or they're sitting at, at, a, at a bar after a conference or anywhere else after a conference, just talking and, and talking shop about a, a topic of importance to all of us. And so uh, my job here today is, is to sort of facilitate that conversation. And if you know me, I'm typically the one that needs that facilitation, which usually falls to either Amanda Mahaffey or Aaron Lane or Virginia Schutte. But, but for today, it's on me. So uh, I'm also pretty big on having measurable objectives. And one of my metrics for success today is, is how little I actually need to talk from here on out. So I'd like to ask each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and give a quick fire story of their own that's inspired them in one way or another. And we're gonna run through this in alphabetical order. And so we will start with Dr. Ken Clark. Hi, I'm Ken Clark. Uh, I'm a research forester at Silas Little Experimental Forest um, in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. And I've worked with Nick for years and it's been a real pleasure. Um, I started, uh, well, PhD and postdoc. I worked at University of Florida um, and so I have a, you know, both a Southern and a, I guess a Northern experience uh, and then spent quite a bit of time in the West also. I used to uh, live in Arcata, California. And I think one of the early sort of fire experiences that I had that made me realize what the real power of fire was, was years ago trying to save equipment from an eddy covariance tower that we had constructed in Florida that burned down in a crown fire in, in 1998. This is when the large, uh, almost, uh, I guess almost half a million acres burned in Florida that, that, that summer. Um, and uh, it was about, we got in there about 10 minutes before the whole stand crown fired. And I had data loggers carried sort of two footballs just basically running for my life. And that made me realize sort of one, how powerful fire is, but also how interesting fire is. And so that was, I think that's my, one of my sort of real fire experiences, I think that's been, that's affected me, affected my life. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, we definitely spent some time together doing carbon stuff and fire stuff. Yeah. Uh, Adam? So I'm Adam Coates. I'm the assistant professor of forest fire ecology and management at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, unique fire story for me was as a 19-year-old who had grew up in the 80s and 90s in the time of Smokey Bear's public service announcements flashing on Saturday morning cartoons. Um, so I thought fire was the evil of all things. Um, and then being in a lab activity as a forestry student and actually being able to see fire, kind of someone set a fire as an intro to show us what prescribed fire could actually do for um, Table Mountain Pine communities. So that's kind of how I got into it and thought I had no idea what was going on, but I knew if I could actually be a part of something with fire, I wanted to do that for a long time. So I'm uh, really excited to be a part of this day. I appreciate the ask to do it and just excited to see all the participants on. Thanks, Adam. Adam and I have definitely spent some time around that fire at Tall Timbers. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, another person I spent some, with some time around that fire, Tall Timbers, Louise. Hey, thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, I definitely know, I definitely remember that, uh, the, those live oaks there in the, in the area in Tall Timbers. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm a research ecologist at the U.S. Forest Service in the Southern Research Station. I'm actually stationed in Athens, Georgia. Um, we are here, we've got the newly established prescribed fire lab. Um, and so we're really excited to sort of continue work in that, in that laboratory. Um, but there's, uh, I would say my, you know, I grew up in the South and I grew up in Florida. So there was fire all around me, but I didn't know it when I was young, kind of like Adam, like it was everywhere, but I didn't really know about it. Um, but so one of my unique uh, experiences when I first started working in Flatwoods, in Longleaf Pine Flatwoods, it was a really rainy season and I was out actually um, banding RCWs. And I was walking around in the swamps and, and um, so I actually started out kind of in the wildlife realm of things, but, but it really you know, gave me a lot of perspective on you know, how important fire really was. And especially when I started to learn about the biodiversity and you know, um, and just how, how amazing the fire community is actually, because the more I got to know fire managers and fire scientists, I, I really enjoyed the people. So, so I had to do sort of this balancing between like the science is really cool, but also the people are amazing too, so. 
Awesome. Thanks, Louise. Megan? Hi, I'm Megan Mitchley. I am a soil ecologist at the Morton Arboretum, which is a botanic garden in the suburbs of Chicago. I'm originally from Northern California and did my undergrad work at UC San Diego. And when I started uh, undergrad my freshman year, there was a big fire season in Southern California. And I was lucky enough to be working for the natural reserves system that the university owned and got to participate in a lot of research looking at the effects of these kind of stand replacing fires on the plant communities as well as the soil. But it really wasn't until 15 years later when I started at the Arboretum that I actually started to do my own research looking at the effects of prescribed fires on the ecosystems that we find in a whole new set of suburbs. So I've just been embedded in kind of these urban wildland interface sort of systems. And I'm excited to hear about everybody else's experiences and how they've been managing fires in these unique areas. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Jessica, you are last, but definitely not least. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jessica Meisel. I'm an associate professor at Michigan State University. And I work in ecosystem ecology and biogeochemistry, which just means we study how elements and nutrients cycle through ecosystems, um, especially forest soils is a big focus. Um, my introduction to fire came uh, right after undergrad with the National Park Service. I worked as a fire effects monitor, um, and that provided me with the opportunity to get involved with fire suppression. Um, in my first detail, I definitely got bitten by the fire bug, as we say. Um, and really hooked my interest, not just in um, fire and observing fire, but also in the, the leadership structure and the communication, the emphasis on good communication. So all of that has been a really um, valued, important part of, of my own experience. Um, after that, I worked with a variety of different land management or NGO organizations, uh, ended up in the for with the Forest Service in the Northeast with the Green Mountain National Forest. And that was my first introduction to prescribed fire. So Ken mentioned he was captivated by um, the power of fire. And what I really remember is the first time I observed um, a, two managers igniting a grassland and the way that they interacted with fire in a very dynamic and deliberate way. And I was just captivated by the role that fire plays as in relationship with the ecosystem and also in relationship to, to, to um, managers. So I see humans as part of that relationship. Um, eventually that led me into fire research, but my goal with research has always been to um, help provide information that managers need to answer management questions um, for the purpose of conserving and protecting our, our natural resources. Um, and as part of that interest, I serve as a co-PI for the Lake States Fire Science Consortium. Um, I'm a member of the board of directors for the Association for Fire Ecology, which has a conference coming up. We'll put in a plug for that. Um, and also as a postdoc uh, researcher at the UW-Madison, uh, was involved with starting the Tallgrass Prairie and Oak Savannah Consortium. Um, so really happy to be here. Um, and thanks to the whole organizing team for putting this together. All right, thank you so much. FEMO is my favorite qualification and I rarely get to go out as a FEMO, actually only once. <laughs> um, so so uh, we sort of gave all of the participants the option of submitting a question. And so we had uh, a lot of participants. So we sort of, I sort of grouped these questions into a couple themes, I would say. And so I guess I, I'm just gonna kind of guide the panel through four different themes that I've, I've garnered from these individual questions. and. I think that the first one we're going to start with today is this, uh, the terrestrial carbon cycle. And, and one of the things that we hear as far as carbon management goes is sort of, uh, are, you know, do wildfires basically have more of a, do they emit more carbon to begin with? And then what does the sink look like afterwards? So basically how does a wildfire alter the terrestrial carbon cycle versus a prescribed fire? And almost this question of like, can we kind of manage fire or manage the carbon cycle with prescribed fire as opposed to letting it go in a wildfire. 
And so I'm hoping that one of you guys might want to kick that conversation off in a more eloquent way than I just did. Here, I can, I can, I can jump in first here. Um, there's, there's, and, and what I'd like to do first is just address just sheerly the carbon cycle first before we get into sort of other uh, aspects. And there's been um, a, a, quite a bit of work using uh, eddy covariance towers in sites that have burned, um, either as a chrono sequence where uh, things get set up right away after a wildfire and compare those to an unburned site uh, and say this would be uh, in boreal forest, uh, part of the Boreas experiment in the, in, uh, in the past, um, uh, in Alaska, also a site in Arizona, um, where they've been able to use this chrono sequence uh, uh, approach to measuring what happens. And um, certainly there's a very large release of carbon um, during fires. Uh, and then it takes, in terms of wildfires, on average about 10 years and somewhere between eight and 12 before the stand has actually gotten, is actually starting to sequester carbon again. Um, for what we've seen for prescribed burns is that's much shorter and that um, at least in our ecosystems, which are, uh, um, pitch pine, um, mixed uh, oak, pitch pine, and then oak forest, is that um, about two to three years worth of accumulated carbon is released basically in that afternoon of a fire. And then it takes about two to three years to reach what's termed carbon neutrality. In other words, we've released, we've now, the stand is, has leafed back out, has taken up enough carbon um, that it could actually uh, then be accumulating carbon through time. Um, so this would be essentially carbon neutrality point. Um, so that, and, and that, of course, there's lots of variability around that that's, that's driven by, by variability in fire behavior, uh, in the fuels that are accumulated and things like that. So, you know, just maybe just overall rules of thumb. But what that means for, um, for prescribed burns is that is that a rotation of say um, anywhere from five to eight years is that those stands are, are accumulating a moderate amount of carbon even with those with those treatments and these are you know operational prescribed burns not just experimental burns um, so that you know I think if you sort of put that into perspective of the wildfires if you're preventing those you know large releases of carbon uh, using prescribed burns but releasing a small amount of carbon during prescribed burns, you have this really nice trade-off. And so we're really trying to burrow down on this and, and understand like, well, what exactly are controlling these things? After that, um, it, or in some of the other fluxes, it looks like say ecosystem respiration is slightly depressed. And that would be both the overall release of carbon, say like at, during the night, uh, overall ecosystem respiration is actually, either unchanged or slightly depressed. And a lot of that is because of the release uh, or the consumption of labile litter um, and reduced uh, autotrophic respiration, which would be you know, release of carbon uh, from respiring vegetation, which, which gets, gets released. What we've seen in some systems is if there's a lot of residual coarse woody debris, is that that over time continues to release carbon. And so, you know, depending on what happens to that stand, if it's salvage log, that's not, that doesn't occur because then, you know, those stems are taken off site. But if they're left on site, then we've, we, we can see that through time, there's actually redu reduced carbon uptake, but it's because of that enhanced respiration. So with that, let me turn it over to, to the other experts here. I think that's a good good place to start, Ken. Um, just emphasizing the the carbon sequestration, the process of taking carbon out of the atmosphere, and the pro versus the process of releasing carbon. And you know, just looking through some of the original questions that were answered, what really um, stood out to me is um, just the importance of like how we use the terminology. And there there are a number of questions about how carbon 
sequesters um, carbon. And so I think it's important to just even take a step back and talk about like what is what is sequestration and it's it's a process of drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it into some pool. So um, a, a pool might be the biomass. Um, and so Ken mentioned, um, you know, mortality to biomass. So you're you're changing the pool from a live pool to a dead pool, and those cycle differently, um, and they affect the release of carbon through respiration back to the atmosphere. And um, when we think about carbon storage, it's really like how much is present in a pool. And a pool might be um, the above ground biomass, a pool might be the roots, a uh, pool might be the soil. And it's just about how much carbon is there. And some of the questions about um, um, sequestering, I think really apply to stabilizing carbon. And that's really about how quickly the carbon cycles. And you know, Ken mentioned respiration. So that's the release of carbon through um, plant physiological processes or microbial processes, microbial decomposition, that's returning carbon to the atmosphere. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that's come up a couple of times in the original questions was the question about charred biomass or pyrogenic um, biomass, that's a, a topic um, my group focuses on quite a bit. And so yes, carbon or fire can stabilize a portion of biomass carbon by converting it to a different chemical structure that is less, um, that cycles more slowly in the ecosystem. So it stabilizes part of it, but that's different than actually sequestering it. So the role of fire in the carbon cycle is really releasing carbon, even though some of the carbon that is being affected by fire becomes more stable than it, the uncharred biomass was. So just, you know, kind of taking a lay of the land, what, is, what are these terms we use when we talk about the carbon cycle and the carbon budget? Um, and that can really help, what hap uh, help us understand what happens to, to different types of carbon in a fire um, as well as after a fire. And a, and a good point to go off of that is the idea that I think, and I, and I teach wildland fire classes at Virginia Tech. We have a wildland fire minor. So these questions come up a lot. And I think one thing I try to point out for the students is when you talk about what does fire do overall, right? It becomes super tricky to define. And so it's kind of you swing on this pendulum from talking about what fire actually can be, you know, that it's a biochemical reaction. You have all these things occurring at, at once. But then there's this very big separation oftentimes between wildfires and prescribed fires in a given ecosystem with a particular vegetation that, that forms in that area or in that region, in that ecosystem. And then the fire frequency that's involved, the fire behavior that's associated with that. Are we talking about high intensity or low intensity, low severity, high severity? Like there's so many, it's the ultimate thing to play with and think about so many different questions. It's the ultimate sandbox is kind of how I tell the students. But what I feel how prescribed fire can often get a rap is bad rap is that people will want prescribed fire effects in with you know wildfire effects and without this differentiation and even taking prescribed fire and differentiating it by really important things that managers use to build prescriptions it becomes really tricky you know to define fire always does this you know it's that's the I saw in one of the questions someone said kind of where do we go next or what continues to occur as questions I mean, they're endless, especially with prescribed fire, because some, some prescriptions can be so specific, even when you begin to include different ignition techniques and different types of vegetation that have occurred only because fire has been included, right? So this idea, exactly what the other panelists have talked about so far, of defining these terms and defining even which type of fire are we describing becomes critically important, especially when we're weighing what becomes important to the given landowners or stakeholders in an area well, what are they most concerned about, right? And what are the managers, what objective are they trying to reach by either including or excluding fire, suppressing it when it's occurred and those kinds of things. Yeah. Go ahead, Louise, the, sorry. No, that's right. Um, one thing I wanted to talk a little bit about um, to sort of follow up with what, what you've already said is, you know, there's been some um, interesting work to sort of see you know, and it, it is definitely ecosystem dependent, right? But, you know, if we have repetitive prescribed fire over a certain amount of time period, 
how does that compare to like a wildfire regime in terms of carbon sequestration? And there's been a lot of people done some work. I've done some work on this. Um, it's usually done, I mean, some of it's done in the field, but it's really hard to just because it takes a long time to collect that information. So most of it's done with simulation modeling and it's typically done like at a landscape regional scale, that sort of thing. Uh, and given what we know about carbon flux, you know, as we've been talking about in and out of the system, um, if, if an area is maintained by prescribed fire, um, it can often be either, we were talking about carbon neutral, right? Or it can actually become a carbon sequestration pool um, sort of through time compared to most wildfire regimes. And that can be anywhere from, you know, whether a wildfire occurs every 20 years or every 50 years or, you know, whatever kind of interval you kind of want to, want to you know, describe there. Um, but, uh, but again, it is, it does, it is dependent on, on the system. Um, and so to, it's, it's kind of these like, you know, we talk about this sort of short-term, long-term trade-offs and we, we can get into that later too when we talk about, I know we're gonna talk about like management manipulation, you know, across the landscape, fuels management and things like that, fuels treatments and, and whatnot. But I just wanted to point that out when it, it's, it's, it's um, when you're thinking about carbon sequestration, um, time is, is really important to think about um, in terms of when we're talking about sequestration. Um, and what it, you know, how stable of a carbon system do we have? Um, and so I just wanted to bring that up for just for thinking about that a little bit more. I'm trying to frame, I, I kind of have a question for you guys. I'm trying to frame in my brain how to ask you the right way though. So Louise, you just mentioned this idea of scale, time scale, and how prescribed fire affects carbon pools on a different time scale than wildfires do. And, and I guess, can one of you guys sort of get into the sort of like this, how structure changes or the physiological responses that are different between prescribed fire and wildfire? Why, what, the why, do you, why is that, right? You, everybody's kind of hinting at like that those are different, but what, like what actual mechanisms are in the like ecosystem after a fire that would make a prescribed fire say more prone to sequester carbon as opposed to a wildfire? Or even if we think of it as like a, a storage and then a cycle, right? Um, if you don't mind, I, I'm going to jump in again here. Um, I, I think a lot of it is also just, it has, it really has to do with consumption, right? Like how much are we actually, as we say, consuming or actually emitting from that fire? And that's kind of regardless whether it's prescribed fire or wildfire, because I've seen wildfires act like prescribed fires. Um, just, and so it really depends on, it really depends on consumption and whether, Typically, when we think of a prescribed fire, we're talking about consuming the, the understory, right? Whether it's grasses or shrubs or, or that sort of thing, or if it's the grassland, it's just the grasses, right? Um, but then um, a wildfire, we're typically in, it's typically in more extreme weather conditions. So it's typically drier, um, the winds are higher, um, you know, you maybe got topographic, you know, you, all those things are, are much less controlled. Uh, so so I, I think it really has to do with more consumption rather than maybe the differences between wildfire and prescribed fire. Uh, and, and so when we're doing the thing with prescribed fire, a lot of the overstory is going to remain intact. Um, I mean, there are instances, right, where we're going to kill the overstory by consuming duff. You know, that's, that's another thing we can get into. But, but yeah, I, I think there's, there's definitely that to consider. It's not necessarily this wildfire prescribed for, I think it has to do a lot more with intensity and how it actually affects the ecosystem in terms of mortality. Anybody else? Cause there any, anything to add there from like the soil carbon perspective, you know, like, I mean, Louise, I like how you basically just made this continuum of fire like basically fire dynamics, I'll call them. I don't like to say fire behavior or fire, like just fire dynamics. So I think the beauty of prescribed fire is that we can kind of go in and select what we want that to be like. That's our idea. We're managing with the tool. And so if we know the conditions that we can go for a desired effect, right? Like a management objective of having a low intensity fire that doesn't consume like a lot of the heavies on the ground or, or doesn't turf into the duff and kill our overstory, right? As opposed to a wildfire where we just really have no control of that process. So, but I know that there's, 
you know, the, from the from the sort of terrestrial ecology standpoint, you know, from basically from everything above ground, I have a pretty good uh, understanding of how those mechanisms work. But I guess, is there anything that the soil scientists can add to that conversation? Yeah, I can say that um, just from the output perspective and then how long things might hang out in the ecosystem side of things with a wildfire it's going and this is i'm sure what a lot of people in our audience and on this panel know but it's going to be hotter and it's potentially going to burn longer than a prescribed fire so that means that the temperature of the soil will be hotter and that the temperature into the soil profile will also be more dramatic so that means we can potentially burn off a lot of the carbon in the soil during a wildfire and much more of that carbon will stick around in a prescribed fire. And in addition, at the lower temperatures, we'll be able to char a lot more of that organic matter and change some of the physical properties of the soil that allow more of the carbon to stick around versus in a wildfire where a lot of that will just be burned off and we won't have that opportunity to potentially have a more stable pool over time. So that doesn't really help us get more carbon back into the system, but it might change some of the ways that that carbon cycles within the system, if that's helpful. And I know I nerded out a little bit, so feel free to ask. <laughs> No, I thought that was really good. There's a good, actually, a topical question just popped up. I know it's not question and answer time yet, but I think it's a good one. Is there a difference in uh, sort of consumption between like a fast burn or a slow burn? So basically the difference between a head fire versus a backing fire on, let's say, soil carbon again. Like what's what would the difference between those two things be? Yeah, I can, I can take a first stab at that, but I'd love to hear from others too. And my favorite answer is it depends on so many things. So, so yeah, the fire, um, the rate of spread is a really important factor for how the fire is behaving. It can influence, you know, whether we are, the combustion process is dominated by combustion, which is an oxidation reaction, the oxygen present flaming, um, carbon released mostly as carbon dioxide and some other gases. Um, but it's more like a cleaner smoke um, and there's more complete conversion to carbon dioxide versus a slower, smokier burn would be more dominated by the pyrolysis phase of the combustion reaction across the continuum. Um, and that's more converting um, the biomass into char and the, the smoke that's produced is typically, we don't get as, as much smoke produced from sm the smoldering phase of combustion as the flaming phase, but it's, it's like dirtier. And so we can see that in the field, it's like black, it's brownish smoke, um, it's really heavy. So there's more particulate matter, which just means like little bits of biomass that are floating around. Um, ash gets suspended, um, more different types of carbon-based gases. Um, and so, you know, it kind of depends on what's the concentration of each of those carbon gases in the smoke and then how much smoke is being produced. Um, but as far as the, the heating and Megan mentioned like how losing carbon from soils in general, we know that carbon in soils is like relatively protected. I'm talking about mineral soil. So after below the organic horizon, if there's an organic horizon, um, carbon in mineral soil is relatively protected. And I say relatively because, again, it depends on how much heat um, the soil is experiencing, like Megan mentioned. And in really dry systems where there's um, a, a prolonged heating or smoldering or like a, a, a fuel pile or really deep duff layers, you can actually put quite a bit of heat into the soil. And one, you're changing its chemical composition. So you're changing how quickly it cycles. Uh, two, you're changing the, the soil structure, like Megan mentioned. Um, and three, you can also actually be losing carbon um, through oxidation and releasing gases from, from the soil it, itself. 
but in general, uh, like a faster moving fire just won't, won't be present, won't have a long enough residence time at any one location to cause much impact to the mineral soil carbon. Um, so this ties into Luis's comment about different ecosystem types because in a grass, and we know that there's lots of carbon in the roots and in the soil, um, and that's relatively protected from fire. So most of the effect of, effect of fire on ecosystem carbon will be on the above ground biomass, which grows really quickly when the roots are um, intact and when they're perennial plants um, versus a, a site that um, might have more biomass above ground that then the bio the carbon in the biomass would, is what would be affected. Yeah, I, I think that um, the I would love for some of the ecophysiologists to talk about this a little bit more, but the it seems like this the soil carbon pool is probably the least understood in terms of like how much is actually being sequestered. Um, like we have some scientists down here um, that are trying to understand, you know, how much for every prescribed fire, like how much of the like really fine particles of like soot are actually sort of maintained in that soil and it's just like compounded, you know, through every prescribed fire. So be inter I'm curious if anybody else has, like, has a comment on, on that in terms of like fine scale carbon storage. Yeah, I can say just from our site where we have high frequency, I would say, prescribed fire, like every couple of years as kind of an extreme compared to an unburned area. We hypothesized that we would see a buildup of that like charred type of compound over time. But instead, we didn't see these charred compounds build up. Instead, we saw that there were more um, hydrophobic, so water, um, compounds that didn't like water being built up and that was leading to carbon um, being kind of protected so that when it rains that carbon doesn't wash away. So we end up seeing a buildup of soil carbon in our prescribed fire sites but not because of the mechanisms that we would have hypothesized like more charred carbon but instead more protected carbon by compounds that aren't allowing the water to break that carbon apart and, and flush it out of the ecosystem. So I think we're seeing what you probably expect, expect to see overall, but not for the mechanism that most of us would have hypothesized. But I'd be interested to know if Jessica, who has a lot of charred carbon experience, has also seen similar phenomena. Well, actually, what um, I don't know that I have a good answer to that. I think your results are, are really interesting. And that's, that's, it touches on a lot of the things like we don't know yet very well about how fire affects organic matter in soil and for how long. Um, and that you're seeing some uh, hydrophobicity uh, in your, it's like no Northern Illinois, right? The, the Arboretum, uh, that you're seeing hydrophobicity there is, I think is really interesting. Typically, we assume that happens in really high temperature fires, but so, you know, so maybe you're getting areas that are um, experiencing higher temperatures, or maybe there's other reactions going on that we don't understand well yet. Um, but I, you know, I think it's your results are just show how, I guess, the the really fine scale effects that fire can have, even in systems that we don't really think about as experiencing high severity fire. Um, and I actually, with Luis, with your question made me think more about what makes me think, it gives me another question more than the answer, which is um, what I wonder about is how does, how does fire affect, um, you know, root growth in, after, after fire in a grassland? Because we know that fires produce um, an ash layer, which is mixed mineral ash, like the white ash we see and the black ash, which we call char or, ch or charcoal. Um, but that mineral ash is really high in nutrients. And some of the research we've done up in the Moko Barrens um, in Northern Wisconsin, uh, we've actually measured how much ash is produced by, by the prescribed fires there, what its chemical composition is, 
and and then also looking at the the soil chemistry after um, after the fires. And so we know that ash leaches into the soil after fire. What we didn't um, take good measurements on for that study was you know how that would affect root growth. Um, afterwards. So it's kind of like there's a pulse of fertilization. We know that there tends to be more flowering um, in the year after fire, uh, but I'm just not familiar with um, what the research says about uh, root biomass growth in grasslands after fire. I'd be curious to know if anybody else has that information. Yeah, I mean, you hit right on exactly what I was thinking is everybody's kind of talking is this idea with soil and the complexity that's there from we're thinking about carbon pools, but then there's all these things that are going on in soils related to their physical properties, their chemical properties, and their biological properties. So it's like with the cycling being as complex as it is, especially if we were to go into something like nitrogen cycling instead of carbon, like there's so many things that you can look at with nitrogen cycling. And I say that in the frustrated <laughs> tone because I did that for my master's. Um, and it felt like I was just hitting a wall, right? Because it's like, I think I got this figured out. I've looked at ammonium and then you're like, well, I didn't actually look at this whole other form, or I didn't consider some of the microbial activity in that maybe a certain type of microbe is changing and I'm not even taking account of that and how I'm actually processing through this and maybe nobody's done that. And so I think that idea of, you know, where are these, what is actually happening and seeing some of these pools. One of the things that I've been really interested in and it, and it kind of ties back into our overall objectives is we've done a lot of things to look at kind of pools of different nutrients and looking at carbon and nitrogen and soils at different depths and different types of soil with different fire frequencies, all that, all that good stuff that can be included there. But then oftentimes we don't ever look at from that understory development and you hit right on the idea of, of kind of root growth and root, how of roots kind of go after you pad fire. It's like when you begin to recruit different species in the understory too, how are they, what is their uptake of some of these nutrients too? Because if we're just looking at the soil for these pools and thinking of the fire effect for the soil response, right? It's like, well, if we're seeing some of these pluses and minuses in the soil, what does that mean is happening with the vegetation that's actually coming back in after the fire? And do we have different, different kind of rates of mobility and other things where we think about certain nutrients are being taken up where other ones might be leached from a site, again, based on the dynamics that are at each site. And so, I think some of the stuff we have looked at related to ash in the coastal plain of South Carolina, there were some assumptions about the functional groups of chemicals we would find in the ash just based on the fact that they were burned. You'd see these immediate pulses of those nutrients and, and, and those functional groups. And we actually just didn't see that happen because it was a lot of fast moving surface fires and the outside environment was kind of um, in close proximity to a steel mill and a paper mill and other things that are contributing to atmospheric loads as well. And so it's like, Actually, I don't know that in this case is kind of the same effect whether you burned or not because you have this repeated frequent fire system uh, where there's really no litter and substantial litter or duff that's being accumulated. And so you kind of have to think of that from a different standpoint than just somewhere that's 45 minutes down the road where you're in a closed canopy environment and you could kind of think about differences in vegetation in a more broad sense than in some of the things we were seeing in that location. So again, like there's so many questions you can ask. Um, I think so I mentioned nerding out earlier. That's uh, trying to explain this to your kids when you're out in the woods with them of all the things you're seeing. Um, eventually you just stop because you know you're probably doing more harm than good. So, so we can add complex to it depends, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so I want to put, I, I actually put my hat on uh, just because that's me, but um, my fire management hat, back to my fire management hat. Um, I, so you've talked about all these, we have all these complexities and unknowns and things that we don't even really understand about just say soil carbon or even, you know, above ground carbon pools or cycling. But so now my job as with my fire management hat on again, is that I have to like decide, I have a landscape and I have a, a plethora of objectives that I'm trying to implement across this landscape, right? So I might be interested in creating like a diverse bird habitat, creating openings in the canopy, um, I might be just strictly looking at like reducing ladder fuels with my burns or, or, you know, very simplistic sort of fire management operations kind of things, protecting houses in the wooey. So like, I, and I know you guys, again, it's going to be complicated and, and you're not going to, you know, it's going to depend, but like, how do you suggest that, that fire managers try to integrate this idea of carbon sequestration or carbon management into their prescribed burn like programs? We're not just talking about a single burn now, but many burns, how do we, how do, how do you suggest, or what insight could you give to that, that process? 
yeah, I'll, I'll cite a, a study on this one that was done on the Santee Experimental Forest down in South Carolina. And this area in particular is really unique because there's two watersheds they set up to be a paired experiment in the 1960s. So essentially one would continue to have management activities done on it, active forest management, and the other would basically have nothing done. That included a Hurricane Hugo in 1989 ripped through that area in a really drastic way. So you go into this unmanaged stand 50 years after nothing's been done and you see just this huge loads of coarse woody debris. It's, it, you see pines in there, but there's kind of this drastic increase in hardwood cover as well. And it's really dense in terms of just the vegetation and basal areas higher. And we measure all those good things. Then you go into the managed watershed where the most active management that's been done the last 20, 20 years or so is frequent fire every four to five years. Um, generally low intensity and they've done some mastication so it kind of could be thought of as some some thinning actual thinning that's been done and fire as a combination treatment and the one thing we were looking at was kind of what are you getting from a holistic ecosystem response when you do active forest management and when you don't and so looked at again basal area changes fuel dynamics soils nutrients we looked at all of that including water quality and kind of if you looked at all of the boxes that you could check, we did see that soils were changing in some ways and that nutrients were decreasing at different depths in the soil, but it basically mirrored the exact nutrient loads that were there for the litter and the duff. So it depended on whether succession had continued to occur and you had more of kind of a climax community coming in in the unmanaged location. And so you could kind of see, and, and I kind of wrote the paper in the end, I was like, well, what do, how do you say what is good or bad on this, right? It's like, we're seeing changes. We're seeing meaningful changes related to management, which hopefully we think that would occur, but the changes, it really would depend on what the landowner wanted. It's like, are you looking for something that has more of a hardwood component to it? The one thing we found that was unique was water quality, some metrics of just sheer water quality, looking at dissolved organic matter and things of that nature, then taking it to the treatability standpoint that if, if humans were consuming this water, how would you put different disinfectants in there to treat those potentially toxic chemicals? And water quality and treatability were improved with the prescribed fire over the long haul in the, in the treated area. Um, and so it's like from a standpoint of what do you do as a landowner, right? I think from that holistic response, how can I benefit the most things for the long term? That definitely checks a lot of boxes, right? But maybe I'm looking at a specific wildlife species that only thrives in, with having that mixed pine and hardwood component there in that location, you might want to opt for something different, you know, for a different composition. So um, I guess I'll go back to my complexity thing, but you're asking the right question is like, so what do, you, what do we point people to with this? And I think that one just had so many responses from a, if you think about climate change, if you think about water scarcity, if you think about all of the dynamics of all the things we're really warning as a society from, you know, our natural lands, it's like, what are we going to get from using frequent and active management that includes prescribed fire, you can see some changes that have occurred, um, but largely those were to the better when you check all of the boxes of attributes we might want to have from that system. Anybody else want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, you know, I also, I, I think if you, if you, you know, think about like whole sort of regions and, and how they are managed um, and, and use say uh, the, 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 the Atlantic coastal plain as an example is where short rotation plantations will definitely take up the most amount of carbon. And so they're running at about six to eight tons of carbon per hectare per, per year taken up. Um, older stands, maybe about two, but those stands are, are, are very dense. Um, there's, there's, uh, extensive ladder fuels in them. And so during any wildfire that those stands are, are crowning. So, you know, again, uh, coming back to the overall sort of large scale landscape scale, how do you, how do you protect these, these stands or how might you manage these, how might industry um, manage stands compared to a, a private landowner that may have other, other uh, options, you know, and again, sort of coming back to how do you, and keep, put this into the overall carbon perspective. Um, you know, I think one of the other points that, that I'd like to bring up, and this comes back a little bit to what, what Louise and, and, and Jessica were touching on, is that um, 
wetland systems that, that are in all of our ecosystems, um, certainly all along the Atlantic coastal plain, store much more carbon than the upland systems. And so one of the things as a manager that, that we could probably do or should think about doing is, is really protecting that carbon, um, that stored carbon in those histosols. Um, if you look at, say, some recent work that was done in Pocasines in, in North Carolina, the amount of carbon that was released from, from a, a, a pond pine stand, this is some recent work by Mickler, um, it's just unbelievable. It's just, it's just orders of magnitude larger than what gets released from, from upland stands. And so, you know, again, if, if, if you're managing for a, a very complex system that has both upland and wetlands, the design of those prescribed burns might actually be to try to protect those wetland systems and those, that histosolic carbon. Um, uh, anyway, just a, a, a thought about sort of the landscape scale or the regional scale that we might want to consider. So, go, go ahead, Jessica. Oh, I was, I was just going to build off that a little bit too. Um, and what I think about is the importance of thinking like an ecologist, whether you are technically an ecologist or not. I think we all need to think holistically, like Ken mentioned, thinking at the landscape scale, and there's different patterns that fire um, can affect, or we can use fire as a tool to create or um, alter a certain patterns, landscape patterns. Um, but I guess what I want to say about uh, ecosystems, and this touches on what Adam uh, mentioned, is we need to understand the characteristics of the ecosystem that we're managing because a forest with a deep death layer is a very different system um, and stores carbon in very different places than a grassland where a lot of the carbon is below ground um, versus a wetland where the carbon is below ground in the soil itself, which is, it, it can become a fuel when it's dry enough. Um, and there's a comment someplace in the chat, it's, it's long gone in the queue right now, but there's a question about like how do we prioritize carbon management? And the I think the poster uh, mentioned something about plantations. And you know I like Adam's point that we can't have the same objective for all ecosystem types. Um, and my perspective as an ecologist is really I think about ecosystem health and all the different components of the ecosystem functioning together to maintain the health of that ecosystem. And I think on one hand it's it's really good because this message of the need, we need to, like as a global society, we need to store more carbon. Um, we need to sequester carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, that's really important. So I'm, I'm glad when I hear that there's more awareness of that importance. Um, however, not all ecosystems are healthy when they have high carbon. And so the photo behind me is from the Moko Barrens. The soils are like beach sands underneath a little bit of organic horizon. So the, the objective here is to keep them open and to use fire as a tool to keep them open. Um, the health of this ecosystem is compromised when there is an accumulation of carbon through the development of an organic horizon that historically under their natural pre-Euro-American um, settlement um, uh, time period, fires, main, fires uh, maintained a very shallow to no organic horizon present. And so as we develop more carbon in these systems through canopy closure, shrub, shrub encroachment, canopy closure, development of an organic horizon, we're actually losing the plant and animal species that depend on these open areas. So, you know, I'm always, I cringe a little bit because there have been some really high profile papers that emphasize we need, to, we need to sequester more carbon and put it in soils. And that's not always, that should not always be the objective depending on your ecosystem. So we need to understand, we need to understand the ecosystems that we're trying to manage. And some like a plantation example that was given plantation forestry, that might be a great place to try to stockpile as much carbon as possible because it's already heavily managed. Whereas in more natural systems, the priority may be to maintain its natural function, um, composition of plant and animal species. So can you guys 
I'm just trying to think of things that we kind of glossed over a little bit. Um, but this, so what you just touched on, Jessica, and, and Ken, you had mentioned when we had talked earlier, I guess it was last week now, you know, this idea of the, or the trillion tree initiative, right? We're going to plant, you know, a trillion trees, and that's going to help to offset our, our carbon emissions in the future. Can we kind of comment on how that might, um, how, how if, if not, that's not done properly, how that might backfire on us? I will call on you. Like, all right, who's, who's going to take that one? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think Jessica definitely, you know, talked about that in very eloquently. I, um, I think it really is dependent on your ecosystem, right? And, and um, you know, if if you're managing for a healthy ecosystem. And it requires, you know, prescribed fire, regular prescribed fire. You know, the sort of se carbon sequestration component of it is going to kind of take care of itself, right? Um, you know, the the overstory trees will can, you know, most of them in the southeast, you know, are second growth forests. You know, they haven't even begun to really hit their maximum biomass growth potential. <laughs> You know, if you're talking about longleaf, they can live, you know, four to 500 years. And some, most of these areas don't have trees that are older than 100 years old. You know, there's, there's a lot of growth potential just in the overstory, right? Um, and so just that, and, and that goes also with the, the root system, right? And how that's just maintaining soil structure and maintaining soil nutrients and biodiversity and all these other things. So um, I think I had another point there, but... <laughs> Sort of went on my soapbox, but but I but I think in the in the end, if we're, if our if our if our goal is ecosystem health and you know habitat quality, water quality, um, you know timber quality, all these other things, I feel like sequestration will kind of take care of itself. Um, and and another note also is that you know there's a lot of ecosystems that from you know there's been some really cool work. Um, uh, all over the place, but I, I remember some from um, from the Sierra Nevadas, uh, some work from, from Alan Taylor and some others, this the only author I can think of right now, um, where they basically found that, you know, a lot of these areas like near the Lake Tahoe Basin, pretty much familiar with that, you know, most of those areas were almost entirely shrublands and had very little trees on them. And so for us to be like, oh, there should be all these trees there. And um, anyway, it's, 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 I think it also becomes holistic in, in a way, or like just like perspective, like this is what we think it should be like, you know? Um, and so that, that's getting into, you know, our philosophical views on, on, on that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, and then there's the, um, you know, uh, just consideration of, of climate change and, and how that sort of affects our ecosystems and how we can actually sequester carbon there. I don't, do we wanna go down that road, <laughs> Nick? <laughs> but yeah. Sure, go for it. Me. <laughs> <laughs> you you uh, brought up them. I know, right? I like said the word and that's, that's it, next topic. But the interesting thing about about climate change is it uh, again depends on the ecosystem, and you know even the different tree types or even elevation um, on how the how trees are just in general are going to respond to differences in climate. And as we've seen from a lot of the the face studies, which I'm sure maybe Ken can talk about, you know, some more on um, these enrichment enrichment studies, where they basically found that you know, trees definitely respond to more carbon dioxide where they can sequester more carbon, right? But that's typically short-lived. Uh, and, and so I feel like somebody else should talk about this more, more than me, but yeah, I'm gonna stop at that because I feel like someone else can talk about this better than me. <laughs> well, Amanda kind of suggested that, that a good way to look at this might be to highlight climate change so, or, or to explain how carbon change might influence the 
carbon cycle in the system that you're familiar with. The, the ones that like, okay, so we all have our, our, our study areas, right? So looking at sort of the, this, it, within the context of fire management, how might climate change like impact or influence the carbon cycle and interplay with prescribed fire or wildfire? Like how might that, how might that happen? That's one thing we haven't mentioned as much is like, if we think about climate change from the extent of it's both temperature and precipitation, it might be affected in a given area. You know, the, not only the amount of precipitation, but how it's dispersed throughout the year, the types of winds that are associated with that, the cycles of drying after maybe to increase fuels. And, you know, you have all this biomass that's growing during the growing season because you've had the inundation of rain, but then that's followed by like six months of drought. And so like you can see how the biomass then becomes fuels. It could be wildfire ready in certain locations where ignitions are increased by lightning strikes and all that stuff. Um, the other thing that I think has been thinking about kind of what I said before about this holistic approach of like, where are we checking the most boxes of what kind of is the greatest good, you know, and for the given area, a given location, you got to think with climate change, you're thinking about other disturbances that are occurring within that cycle too, that may amplify particularly fire behavior or a fuels dynamic and some of the carbon cycling dynamics. If you begin to have increased hurricanes and you begin to have all these other disturbances that are coming in, more beetle damage, longer period of time for pest and disease to occur in that location. Like when you begin to, in the, if you've ever seen the diagrams with the, all of the beautiful fire triangles that line up across space and time, and you talk about fire regimes, I think that, I don't know, I don't know if this was intentionally done this way, but the one with climate is kind of at the top of all of the triangles. And so if you begin to monkey with the, the climate, I, I explain it to my students as like a puppet. Everything begins to move in different ways, right? Um, in some cases where I think we could have some response to that when we've seen active weather patterns beginning to change and emerge in specific locations. Um, but then there's to some degree, what do we know about how far ranges will change of where different vegetation might become an invasive might become even more invasive in the, in the uh, extent of climate and does that increase flammability in the location or decrease flammability? What are we actually trying to look at? Um, and so I think that's a, another dynamic of the climate response that often isn't talked about as much as that other disturbances can be co-occurring to actually amplify or you know take away from prescribed fire and wildfire behavior too. And I'm just noting that as a problem, not giving any solutions for it. I'm just you know, pointing it out as a problem. I think uh, yeah that that brings up a, a, a very good point particularly is that there are other drivers of disturbance that are affected by climate and certainly insects is one of them is that I, I don't know if 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 you know who all's been to the west recently but the amount of beetle kill is just phenomenal the mountain pine beetle and same with southern pine beetle working its way up um, through New Jersey now, all the way uh, through Pitch Pine in, in Long Island, and now still going going north. Um, and some projections, uh, some recent projections, you know, suggesting that it's it will get up into into uh, red pine, jack pine, uh, you know, further north. And so, you know, if if we think about sort of designing these stands um, or planting trees, you know, again, it's going to be I think very very important for us to consider what other climate driven disturbances are, are could have potentially occur um, not just not just fire and increase in fire and, and we could we could use fire management to do this um, and maybe a, even another way to think about this and to think about the where fire management might go in the future is that we're, we're already talking and, and in some cases monetizing, carbon sequestration, carbon storage. And what we should also probably be considering is the quality of those carbon credits, those stored credits, and actually think about monetizing how protected they are from wildfires in terms of prescribed burning. And this you know, potentially releases a lot of funds that could be used um, for proactive fire management. Um, so just as we sort of think about, so how, you know, how do you design something like this Trillion Trees Initiative? Um, or how do you design something like large corporations very interested in offsetting their carbon, their carbon footprint? So they're, they're gonna buy, though they will, they already are buying into these carbon credits. But at the same time, I think they're very concerned about the quality of that stored carbon. And again, that could actually 
help, I think, one, design stands that are more uh, resilient to disturbance like this, but also provide you know, some additional funding, I think, for conducting uh, uh, um, fuels treatments and things like that. Yeah, and I think, you know, big picture, we're asking a lot of our, our natural ecosystems. And in talking about climate change, we can ask our ecosystems to enhance carbon storage and offset the amount of carbon dioxide we're putting into the atmosphere. And we might also want to ask our ecosystems to stay resilient and be able to adapt to future climate change. And asking both of those things of one location at the same time might not be possible. Kind of circling back around to what Jessica was saying earlier, we might want to protect certain species that are found in current ecosystems using prescribed fire as a tool and that might be in conflict with our desire to retain the maximum amount of carbon in an ecosystem. And I'd say in general, we should focus more on doing what we can to conserve and protect the services and the species that we have versus asking our ecosystems to be the, the real heavyweights in sequestering as much carbon as possible. Um, as someone who works for the champion of trees, I've been happy that we aren't really on the plant as many trees as possible bandwagon. It's really about protecting the right trees in the right places versus using trees as a tool for solving all of our problems. So I guess I lean towards the, how can we help our ecosystems adapt to climate change using fire as a tool versus how can we maximize carbon storage in these ecosystems in the context of fire as a tool? Yeah, I, I totally agree, Megan. And I and and I and I really think that by focusing on it that way, I think we're still gonna be able to to maintain a lot of carbon anyways on a landscape, but it but it sort of comes down to this climate resilience, carbon resilience. It might not be maximum carbon right but it'll still be probably better than if we didn't manage it you know in a you know better way like that so yeah totally agree yeah and i think i think it's interesting i don't want to go too far out of my box with this comment but um you know there's so much to learn about about sort of our current fire regimes and our current management practices from the past but I do think that oftentimes I've run across fire managers that get stuck in this box of thinking that that's the way that it has to be moving forward. And I think what you guys are talking about is the sort of proactive actions that we can take in the future that define the new what the new landscapes look like that, that, that we have control over and that we need to manage to the best of our ability for the benefit of, of you know human society and also the ecosystem services that go along with that. Um, so I, again, just step way out of my boundary box, but uh, you know. I just want to make sure that we're all sort of thinking forward about how we manage and not necessarily always stuck with that foot in the past. Okay, now I'm facilitating again. So, um, so you guys, there's been a lot of conversation. I mean, we've kind of danced around these like individual, or I, I'd say we've we've been much broader, you know, in our in our conversation today. We're talking sort of in the broad sense, using different examples of things, but. Are there resources that land managers can use to get answers to these questions? Are you guys familiar with like, I don't know, websites or documents that, that someone in managing on the you know, White Mountain National Forest might be able to go to to get a better understanding of like how their ecosystem should be uh, managed for like carbon management or carbon cycling, things of that nature? That is the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. So, the, 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 uh, yep, go ahead, Jessica. Oh, Google go ahead Scholar. and get your thoughts and then I'll jump in. <laughs> okay, I guess that's me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I think that the idea of carbon, well, the reality of carbon markets is still so new. I don't think there's good information on it um, as in terms of information for, for managers. Um, obviously, um, the, the 
network of regional fire science consortia are probably the first stop to go for helping connect with information, research-based information about how fire mm. affects um, carbon pools. So with the Lake States Consortium, we have this online citation database that's designed to help managers find out what research exists um, on their topics. So you can search for carbon, for example, and find all publications from our region um, or that were conducted in our region or have results that are relevant to our region that talk about how carbon stocks are changed by fire. Um, we also develop research briefs from some of those articles and we've just recently started cataloging our research briefs in that same database. So if you search for carbon and you'll see some of the titles begin with research brief, that means it's a summary uh, that somebody has written of a peer reviewed um, article or sometimes a topic. Uh, we are in process um, with Jed Munay at uh, Wisconsin DNR and Colleen Suthmeyer. Um, we are in the process of developing more of a synthesis for our region that would talk about where, how, where is carbon stored in these different types of ecosystems and what do we know about how those carbon pools are changed, increased or decreased by fire and by different types of fire. Um, so that's, that's what we're working on um, over the next few months, probably be about a year, that's you know a year plus, that's about how long it takes to get through a publication process. Um, but we're aware of those, those information needs and we're working to provide them. Um, but others on this panel might know more of where, where's other good information or where are other good sources to look for the information that does exist. Yeah, and, um, Nick and I are, we're, we're putting this in for, well, we've put some of it together already, but Nick and I are trying to put a lot of information together on um, a whole series of prescribed burns and then also using uh, repeated burns at a site that is a carbon flux tower site. Um, and uh, we're, we're in the process of it. We should be done in about a couple of months. And then we've also tried to work uh, with with um, the Florida and the Itchaway uh, Jones Center site in Georgia, because these have been long-term burn sites that have also had carbon flux towers working there. And so you can work out not only what, what is consumed exactly in the fire, but then how fast the recovery from that is. And really trying to you know, burrow down and quantify this track different pools through time. What's happening with Stan Basil area, what's happening with forest floor uh, dynamics, things like that, um, and uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's it's a it's a long process, but uh, I'm hoping we're going to get some pretty nice uh, um, uh, products out quite soon. All right, so we're coming to the end of our our time here today. So I want to just give each of you the opportunity to spend a minute or two on any sort of take homes that you might have for our audience today, uh, anything that's sort of struck you or even things that haven't, we haven't talked about that, that you sort of wanted to get out. Now sort of the time for you to do that. Um, we can, we'll just see if, we'll just see who pops off mute <laughs> at first and we'll just go along that way instead of going alphabetical again. A lot of pressure to give some parting words. Of I know I was going to say I'm really comfortable with the uncomfortable <laughs> silence. <laughs> um, you know, one this time went by really fast. So thank you to all the organizers who put this together, and thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to sit and, and talk together. And I hope sometime in the new, near future we all have opportunity to do it um, safely together in person. Um, I guess, you know, I'll just reiterate, I think it's important to, to think like an ecologist um, as a manager. And I learned so much that I use in my research career. I learned so much from the managers I worked with. So, you know, I think managers, you on the ground know your ecosystems, the ins and outs um, far better than anybody else. And so like rely on that expertise, that first hand knowledge um, to think holistically I think like an ecologist, any treatment we do in a system, it affects all the other components. And, you know, I like um, Alba Leopold's message about intelligent tinkering. We need to know what all the parts are in our ecosystem um, when we're managing for them so that we're retaining their function um, over the long term so that we can support 
ecosystem health. Yeah, I'll, I'll just end by saying, um, yeah, I think just continue fighting the good fight. Um, we all need, you know, for the most part, more fire on the ground. And I think the carbon street constriction part will sort of, like I said, I think kind of take care of itself. Um, I'm sure, it, I mean, as far as I know, it's not really on like a requirement for managers to record these kind of things, you know, how, is, how it's affecting your carbon budget and your landscape. I mean, Maybe I'm speaking, um, maybe I'm not correct, but, uh, but if it does become a thing, you know, we can, we can help you sort of establish what your carbon numbers are, right? And how that might, you know, be affected uh, in your ecosystem as a way you manage it, but just keep fighting the good fight. Yeah, I think I come back to the balances and the trade-offs and the, the dance that you're doing when you're making decisions of, I think this affects this property. I also think it affects this property. I think it affects this property. I think that I'm doing something for water quality. I'm doing something with carbon storage. I'm doing something to nitrogen cycling. Like all of that kind of has to be kept in check, right? And kind of, um, I think the, in some pretty broader research, some, some stuff has come out that like all fire does this. And I think I would definitely be alarmed by things by that because follow your instincts, especially if you're a manager, like follow your instincts. You know that there's a difference between what's going on with, you know, really high severity fires and really low severity fires that, that it's not all equal. Um, and for anyone that's just getting into learning fire, I always encourage my students about this is like start tracking when you're reading through any information where did this happen? What ecosystem were they dealing with? You know, the response that they're measuring, how far after fire did that occur? How many fires are they measuring? Like what was the previous land history? Like trying to define all the information you're taking in by some category, be able to organize by the responses that you're seeing. And I think that's, you know, critically important, not only to like make decisions, but also just for the learning of what, you know, what was said so eloquently about the intelligent tinkering. I mean, that's what we're doing is hopefully coming up with I throw out there again this idea of the greatest good right is like we're doing the best thing not only for our time now but for everyone that comes behind us um and that's what i kind of always think about just looking at it from a you know how are we you know one of the things of looking at prescribed fire is like how are we doing things um, in certain communities to develop to develop those communities for the best good that they can have socially environmentally economically like all those things are brought to the table when people make these decisions and um so it, it becomes a good thing to have, you know, healthy dialogue and conversation about as well as to what are our values of what we're hoping to get from, from these properties. I think, um, you know, also one thing that, that certainly strikes me is that the, you know, the science community, we're developing a lot of tools and a lot of simulation models and things like that. And, but I think, I think one of the things that we really need to do is is to is to try to distill this down, not oversimplify it. And this is kind of getting at something that that everybody else has has brought up, um, but make it make it more useful. And I, I know this is I'm definitely guilty of this. Is you know when you write a scientific paper, I mean those things are so dense that that what we really I think need to do or what we should do is to then think about also integrating in other, other viewpoints and other tools that, that say silviculturalists and, 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 uh, and, and, a, and a number of scientists now are, 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 are discussing things like assisted migration for climate change. But I think that also within that needs to become you know, the recognition of, of you know, how, does, how does fire, how does fire management fit into these sort of larger scale um, uh, initiatives like this, and certainly the Trillion Tree Initiative is one we've already talked about that, but some of these other ideas that are circulating around. And I think as scientists, and I know Adam's really good at this, and, and certainly Louise and Nick and well, all of you, um, you know, about sort of how do we how do we get this message across? And I think that is on us to 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 really uh, put that together. And that's you know one of the things that really strikes me about or what, what all of us do. I think we can definitely say it's complicated and it depends, and that's as true for the carbon cycle as anything else that we might want from our ecosystems or any other tools we might use to manage our ecosystems. 
And I personally just think it's great that carbon and carbon storage and carbon cycling are becoming part of the conversation at all. I mean, in my ecosystem, the use of prescribed fire is really used as a tool to restore oak savannas and hopefully to decrease the abundance of invasive species. And if we can do a little for carbon sequestration at the same time, that's great, but um, we're never going to be able to maximize everything using this, like Adam was saying. We can't maximize everything using one tool. So for those of you who are able to manage landscapes, that's where you might really be able to maximize a lot of functions at once by applying different tools in different ways. So I think it's hard to say, yeah, go ahead and do a prescribed fire in the fall every three years and everything will come together for you, even within an ecosystem. Instead, it's going to be managing different areas of that, of that ecosystem in different ways for different goals all at once. If you or the folks that you work with can do that in concert, I think that's where we'll really, we'll really win. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of our awesome panelists. It was really enjoyable to listen to you guys all talk. Um, I, I just want to thank uh, the organizers of these sessions. This is this is definitely the best format that I've seen and come across, and I know that there's been so much thought that got put into it. And I, I, we really all appreciate it that are on this call. Thank you for putting that together. And thanks for everybody listening in too. I, I guess my, my sort of take home today is uh, there, I, I'm gonna attribute it to Matt Dickinson, but I'm pretty sure Matt got it from somewhere else, but I will give it to him because I heard it from him first. But it's this idea that, uh, you know, fire science is like rocket science, only way more complicated. And, you know, I always, say to Ken and to some other folks, you know, that I interact with a lot, that there's certain fire managers that I feel like it's my job just to kind of download their brain, right? Like if I can figure out how to explain what is in a lot of your heads as to how you manage and things like that, that, that we would be going down the right track. And so please interact with scientists as much as you can. Um, you bring us out of our silos and you are the ones that are really doing the work. And I would also say that, you know, that these things are complicated and it does depend, but the, the things that you have in your brain through continuing your education and just thinking about this stuff, you're the best computer model that we have to get this stuff done. And so have confidence that, that you're making good and solid land management decisions when you're being conscious of, of all these different factors. So again, thanks again to everybody. And I will turn this over to Andrea. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, I just want to say, Thanks again to all our panelists. Just amazing uh, discussion. I so thoroughly enjoyed today. Nick, you're, I want you to facilitate every single webinar and, and uh, discussion that I host from this point on. You're awesome. <laughs> and to all of our participants, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a, a great conversation. So I just want to plug, if, if you enjoyed this discussion, um, tell a friend and come back. We are doing this every month throughout this the winter season. And our next discussion is going to be, is scheduled for December 16th uh, and will be featuring fire and timber management in mixed woods. And we will be focusing on, on challenges and opportunities for using prescribed fire in mixed oak pine forests in the Eastern US uh, with both timber and natural community management uh, values. So we hope you will come back for that discussion. And at this point, that's a wrap. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>